Welcome, everyone. This is Laura Huffman. I'm just watching participants file in electronically, and we will get started here in just a second. All right, it looks like we've got a full house. Um, thank you, first and foremost, thank you all for joining us. My name is Laura Huffman and I am the still relatively new president and CEO of the Austin Chamber of Commerce. Uh, most importantly, I wanna thank you for taking the time to join us virtually today. Uh, I'm really excited about today's topic and the panel. We're gonna hear from healthcare leaders throughout our community on how you can stay healthy during this pandemic. There are other health needs that we all have day in and day out, and they're gonna give us some great advice on how we can stay on top of that. Um, there's no question, this is a difficult and unusual time for all of us. Uh, the Chamber is doing what we can to navigate this time, including delivering really, really good content to our members online, gathering together panels like what you'll see together to make sure that you have just excellent access to information that you need and when you need it. The other thing that we've done is we've worked with the entire business community and our other chambers of commerce to launch the Austin, a city of us campaign. Uh, there you go, you can see the logo now. You'll see this on buses and on billboards. Some of us have the t-shirts and while we're all different, there is an us in Austin, that's the campaign. And we launched this to be part of the healthcare message of wearing a mask and socially distancing so that as a business community we were recognizing that these are things that we each have control over that we can do for each other and for our business community uh, and also quick reminder for those of you that need it election day is here before you know it and the last day to register to vote in the november general election is october 5th um, I want to recognize the many chamber partners that make events like this possible. Uh, our pivotal partners today are Amazon, Ascension Seton, PIMCO, and Wells Fargo. Thank you very much for sponsoring this really important session. And our foundation partners are up next on the screen. Thank you to those of you that are helping offer this content. And finally, our corporate partners. Again, these are some of our best and most relied on chamber members and we appreciate your sponsorship. Um, look, today's day-to-day -day health issues have not disappeared. Um, while we are in the middle of managing a pandemic as, as a healthcare community, as a business community, and as parents and teachers and neighbors, there still are some important health care issues that we all need to take care of, both physical health and mental health, it's worth saying. And what we put together today is a group of experts that can help you understand the best way to manage routine appointments, when to go see your doctor in person, when to use telehealth. Several of us have done that already and have seen great benefits to that. I am really excited excited to introduce, to lead this panel, uh, Dr. Clay Johnson of the Dell. He's Dr. Johnson, as you all know, is the Dean of the uh, Dell Medical School. He is the founding Dean of the Medical School. Uh, Dr. Johnson, you can no longer say you're new to Austin. Uh, you've been here for a while now and the things that you have done shape the way we think and execute healthcare in this community, along with the partners that you'll be introducing on the panel is is nothing short of amazing and i hope you all hear thank you often enough but on behalf of the chamber thank you for what you're doing to transform transform healthcare in austin uh, since 2014 dr johnson has served as the inaugural dean of the dean of the dell medical school and vice president for the medical affairs at the university of texas at austin his vision is to create a new model for academic medicine to accelerate innovation, to improve health, and reduce inefficiencies in the healthcare system. And this includes building a vital, inclusive health ecosystem to support new and innovative models of education, care, research, and community impact, all with a focus on improving health locally as a model for accelerating change nationally. And I think we can all agree that now more than ever, those local models that can scale are essential. 
Uh, Dr. Johnson is the neurologist specializing in stroke care and research. Previously, he was associate vice chancellor for research at the University of California and importantly, was awarded the Austinite of the Year in 2016, along with Dr. Ken Shine. So Dr. Johnson, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for what you've done for our community and thank you to all of our healthcare leaders that are gonna be on the panel for everything you've done and you know, this year in particular to keep our community safe and healthy. Well, thank you, Laura. That was a, that was a very kind introduction and it's certainly been a pleasure to, to be here for these past now uh, six and a half years. And, and uh, I don't know when one officially becomes an Austinite, but I certainly identified strongly as one now. It's been wonderful to be in this community. Um, so in, it's a real pleasure today to be with the, um, the, the crew that I'm, uh, I, we get to interact with um, and to talk about this really, really important uh, topic. Um, so just to, just to set the stage, um, I'm going to just show three slides, and I promise they're not the kind I would show the medical students. So if you can go to the next slide, just to, just to frame things, I, I don't know how often you guys go to the dashboards online, but this is something that I, at you know, 5, 10 every day, I go to get my update on what's going on in the city um, with, uh, with COVID. And um, this, is the, this is the most important dashboard. It shows the number of new admissions to the hospital. Our hospitals all in the metro area um, represented by their chief medical officers today, um, the three big systems. Um, and it shows that from the beginning of the outbreak until uh, two days ago. We don't, we, for some reason, we didn't get an update last night for yesterday. And um, the, you know, you can see that things, uh, you know, were kind of, we were scared uh, back here at the at the very beginning, uh, uh, back in you know March and April, but um, we handled that and things kind of calmed down and stayed pretty much stable. But then, obviously, we we uh, had a, a horrible um, time uh, dealing with a very very rapid increase in in cases broadly in cases through the community, people not being able to get testing, um, not uh, being able to, uh, uh, to be seen, and then um, filling up our, our hospital beds, our ICUs. Um, and then we've had this wonderful decline. And there's a, a great sense of, of, um, of sort of calm right now and, uh, you know, catching breath and, you know, the vacations that have been delayed since February now actually happening with social distancing. And, um, and then repairing, but also preparing. So what's ahead for us now? So the next slide. So one of the, the, the things that we've all watched together and with these CMOs, we've been doing this multiple times a week, are, are what are the projections going forward? And these change dramatically based on behavior. And they're coming largely from, uh, the best data that we have has actually been built on top of our data. So following observations in the community and then plotting those forward and learning from them from Lauren Myers group here at UT. Um, and you can find this online too. It's easy. The last stuff is online. Just search um, APH COVID, Austin Public Health COVID, and that stuff will come up too. Um, in the projections today, if you just were to plot things out today, most likely we're going to see this continue to decline based on current behaviors and current trends things are going to keep getting better. But, um, uh, and so again, this is a good time to catch up on things, to, uh, for us to catch up, uh, for you all to catch up too on, on your healthcare needs. Um, but next slide, that presumes behavior stays like it is today into the future. Well, we're guaranteed that that will not happen, right? So uh, UT is, uh, um, started back in, in classes today. Um, honestly, I don't think that classes themselves are going to put the community or UT um, students and faculty at risk, but the activities that happen outside of class, particularly in the, in the uh, evenings and on the weekends, um, very well may. And then we have um, AISD restarting, and then I, I just got a, a message that it may be easier for our bars to open up now by associating with, uh, with things like uh, food trucks. Um, so those are the kinds of things that one can expect, you know, as we all calm down, then we start to behave differently. And so 
with that behavior, one would expect that cases would return. And so this is, uh, you know, one projection of what that could look like. These are, these are always wrong, you know, because the behavior changes and you can't really predict the future. So this is wrong, but it does suggest based on the kinds of behavior changes that one could expect that, um, that we will probably see another spike. When will that happen? Um, you know, the, here it could start as early as uh, late September that we start to see an upswing and then getting into cases near our peak by late October. So, so just so um, we're, we are all real, yes, it feels good now, but we're not out of this yet. And I think people have an awareness of that having gone through um, two of these uh, 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 bumps um, thus far. Um, so um, today we're gonna have an interesting conversation about just a little bit of frame setting in terms of the, the you know, where we've come, but then getting to questions about what does this mean for you all um, uh, in the public, in the health system that we have? Um, what, what can, you know, what's a, what's a, what should you be doing and what shouldn't you be doing? Um, we're not gonna get enough messaging on masks and things like that, so we're gonna focus more on how you interact with the health system today. So uh, very fortunate to have a, an all-star panel um, and we've had um, lots and lots of meetings together as we've worked with the, the mayor and the county judge and also public health leadership to help to sort of get the city prepared. And that's been just wonderful work. I mean, I think normally you'd expect these four guys to hate each other, right? They're always trying to steal each other's market share. And, but in this case, they, we've all come together wonderfully um, and um, dealt with common issues and, um, and made substantial progress and I think brought our community forward in a, in a way that, that others have, um, have envied. Um, and uh, it's certainly been my pleasure to be a part uh, of, of this group. Um, so I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Um, and maybe um, um, Samson, uh, do you wanna start us out? Yes, Clay, thank you again. Uh, good afternoon all. And my name is Samson J. Sudas. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer, which is the Chief Physician Executive for Ascension Seton. And we've been part of this community for a long time and we are members of the Chamber of Commerce and thank you for having us today. And Jay, you wanna go? Sorry, um, Jay Zadonik, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Austin Regional Clinic. Um, I'm a primary care uh, physician by trade um, and have moved into the Austin marketplace about the same time that uh, Clay moved to uh, Austin, so I would consider myself an Austinite also now. Um, hey, Rob? Sure. Uh, my name is Rob Watson. I'm a, I'm a practicing general surgeon, but I'm also a senior vice president and chief medical officer for the Austin Round Rock region of Bayward, Scott & White. I've been with the organization since, and, and then this uh, area, uh, since 2006. And then Ken. You're muted, Ken. Yeah. Um, okay, can the host unmute me? Unmute myself. Can you, you hear me? Did. We can hear you. Yeah, so a uh, privilege to be here today. Thank you uh, for inviting me. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for St. David's Healthcare. I'm an internal medicine physician by training. I've been in Austin since 1988 and uh, as a practicing physician for many years at the Austin Diagnostic Clinic uh, with CMO, Chief Medical Officer at St. David's North Austin Medical Center for 10 years and then have been in this role for about three years. So we've had a very interesting uh, five month journey now um, uh, with COVID-19. And as Clay said, we have all uh, been in many, many, many hours of meetings together, collaborating uh, around how to best prepare our community to make it through this pandemic. Yeah, great. Good. Well, you know, let's 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 start about that with that. Um, uh, uh, just look back a little bit. Um, so, I mean, what what would you all say? What have been the major struggles? If you you know if you if you're going to have PSD, PTSD after this, what's it? What event or what issue is it going to be based on? Um, I don't know who who wants to start. Uh, 
Ken, you're on my screen still, so why don't you start? Uh, so I would say uh, probably the biggest struggle as, as we look back on this has been um, um, staffing our hospitals and responding to the surge that we had in July. And so if you go back to the beginning of COVID in March and then what I call the dark days of the lockdown uh, during April and you know, the impact that that had on our hospitals and hospital staffing. Um, you know, we, we were not hiring employees. We're very proud of the fact that we never laid an employee off during the pandemic across St. David's Healthcare, uh, but we also weren't hiring uh, employees. And then, uh, you know, business came back a little quicker than we expected. And just as we're um, getting back in the swing of things and starting to reboot non-COVID care and, and surgery and elective surgery. Uh, then we get into this huge surge that uh, we saw on the graphs and that we experienced in July. And, and what we saw during that surge was an incredible demand more on our intensive care units. Uh, and um, it was very challenging for all of our, our health systems and for our, our employees, our nurses, and our physicians. So to me, that's probably been the greatest challenge so far, staffing, staffing, and staffing, to make sure that we had adequate staff, that you know we had a lot of staff that were out sick with COVID, uh, and, uh, and it's been a big challenge. Yeah, yeah. Any, anything to add others, like a, yep. that call that made your heart sink? <laughs> yep, I'll go next, uh, Clay. And in addition to what Rob mentioned, um, in addition to what Ken mentioned, one of the things that we began with was people had this fear of COVID, not knowing exactly what was coming. At that point, all we had was news from China, news from Italy, and news from Europe. So we did not know what we were encountering. So that was the first thing. The second was, as we came into the pandemic, uh, we found ourselves woefully unprepared as a country in order to be able to tackle this on, mainly with regard to PPE and other supplies. And that was kind of very hairy right at the beginning. But then again, we're grateful to be part of a system, of a national system. So we quickly got on board, got enough supplies, both of uh, PPE and other things, and we were able to get on board. The other major area, as, as uh, Ken mentioned specifically, was uh, keeping our uh, providers safe during the pandemic. A lot of work and a lot of preparation went into making sure they had everything that they needed in order to take care of patients and do that. So for example, we went ahead and initially started stockpiling uh, ventilators, not knowing exactly what we would need. Looking at Italy, they had a huge need for ventilators. So we went ahead and stockpiled a large amount of ventilators just to make sure we had adequate supplies. So a lot of work went into that and uh, we, uh, the, the uh, system rose to the occasion in, order in, in making that happen. And as we went through the pandemic, as Ken mentioned, a lot of work went into keeping people uh, without having to kind of get exhausted because that was the other thing we saw, which was I mean, most other cases, what we've seen is you have a bad day with trauma. You have uh, multiple accidents, people come in and we deal with that, that gets over. Or you have a huge spell where we have multiple cases, it gets over. Sometimes it lasts a week when we have the flu or two weeks, but this went on and on and on and on with no end in sight. And that was what was starting with, with, our, with our physicians, with the nurses, with the caregivers, is just to keep that level of vigilance again, just to make sure that they do the things they ought to do at all times and make sure that they don't uh, catch the infection by letting their guard down, as well as the mental and emotional strength that is needed. Because again, these are caregivers on the front line, nurses and other staff who not only put in long hours, but then at the end of the day, they got to go back home and take care of family members change in the garages, go home, take a shower before they go hug their children. That is what we dealt with. So those are the challenges that I uh, remember vividly, will never forget. Thank you for asking. Yeah. yeah. Anything to add, Jay or Rob? Yeah, I mean, I think I would just add that the, the, the interesting thing about this is that the challenges have been evolving. I mean, we, we definitely went from that period of the unknown uh, that Samson mentioned to a period of known, and, and that was both of those events were scary once we realized the magnitude of what this uh, was or what it could be uh, early on. Um, but I, I think that you know the, the points that I would 
stress, uh, certainly the health and well-being of our patients and our staff. I mean, those have been major points all through this. Uh, you can spread that now out to even the economic well-being of our patients and our staff and, and sort of the halo effect that I think that could occur from this or that we will, there, there's actually data to, to prove that this is occurring is we've sort of geared up now for this COVID related response, but what we're starting to see in that halo effect is, is all the, uh, the impact of patients that did not have COVID not coming to the hospital not going to their doctor's office. I think this is going to have a lasting public health impact. Uh, we've done so much work leading up to this point around preventative care, around trying to engage patients and being sort of prophylactic in their health and, um, you know, really working with their physicians. That this seems to have eroded that to a great degree. And if we can't seem to get our arms around how to re-engage our patients around their, you know, chronic health conditions and other things that we're definitely going to see a lasting impact uh, yeah. from the virus. So. Yeah, that, that, we'll get to that one because that's a, that's obviously a you know a critical issue. Jay, what what you want to add? Something? So, if I were to reflect back on the beginning of this, it's, it's interesting. Uh, first off, I'd like to echo the comments that you made, which is that Central Texan uh, population really does not recognize how lucky they are. Um, it, this was a very unique time. Uh, it's a once in a lifetime event that occurred here, and to see the three major healthcare systems along with the medical school absolutely collaborating on a daily basis to ensure that there was adequate number of beds and ICU beds. I mean, that I just, that's applause to all of you. As the non-hospital entity on this panel, uh, and as the entity that has to deal with everyday healthcare uh, out in the field, um, it was a little different for us. We weren't necessarily uh, trying to figure out where we're going to have enough ICU beds or enough ventilators. We were trying to figure out how are we going to completely overturn our our current business operations into an a, an operation that was going to allow us to do three critical things that we believed at the very initial part of this uh, that were important. Number one was to serve the population for their needs for any potential COVID, and that meant having enough uh, protective uh, equipment. And, uh, and being able to keep our staff safe so that they could serve that patient population. But the second and most important was that we recognized that the biggest way that we could make an impact to the community was to be able to keep our patient population out of, out of the ERs and, and not have people go to the ERs at a time when it was gonna probably be overrun and, and really make people more susceptible. So we, we came up with some very unique ways to be able to do that from telemedicine being implemented uh, literally within a 48 hour period of time uh, to creating a, a, a high acuity triage uh, team that uh, every uh, triage call that came in that would typically or normally have said, go to the emergency room, uh, that got reviewed and screened by a physician and then that patient was brought in to, to be taken care of. And fundamentally, number three, recognizing that chronic health care continues to go on in the face of, of an adversity like a pandemic. It, the, the world doesn't stop. Health care issues don't stop because there happens to be another pandemic going on. So we critically wanted to be able to address that. And to do that, we, you know, we struggled with operating, uh, making that an operation that was able to be done timely, safely, and conveniently to keep the patients safe. We had to figure out how to be able to um, separate out those people who had potential COVID-like symptomatology from those who had non-COVID symptomatology that was related to possibly having um, you know, uncontrolled diabetes or, or stroke or, or abdominal pain, diverticulitis, et cetera. And, and so, you know, coming up with that uh, uh, was, was one of the initial things that we had to struggle with. And, and because we knew so little, I kind of felt like I, I was in that scene from uh, Game of Thrones when the White Walkers from the North were coming down. We really didn't know what that meant, right? Um, but then as we got into it and we started to, to go through it, it became evident that what we needed to do and, and uh, and we believe that, that was the best way that we could contribute to what our, our healthcare systems within this community were able to do. You, you needed John Snow. That's what you needed. Yeah, well, and, uh, you know, I had Norman Chenman, so that was close. <laughs> so, um, so great. So those are those are all uh, all you know really interesting observations. I, 
Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I remember the, the sinking feeling multiple times with late night phone calls, I'm sure you all do too, related to a whole variety of different disasters that we've now gotten through. So I'm, I'm hopeful that um, the White Walkers are at bay and, um, and uh, that we're on the right course, at least for the time being. So Ted, let's turn to that. So how are things now? So how are things in, in, uh, in the hospital systems now? You got, um, is it empty? Is it uh, back to normal? Is it uh, somewhere in between? Um, how are the staff? How, you know, I know one thing I do want to say, you, you all touched on this. You, you all, all did a remarkable job of keeping your staff healthy. We did too for ours, but do you, I mean, uh, the number of people exposed to COVID, most communities, there were many more infections of, of uh, staff so that happened on the job. And that almost didn't happen in this community, which is really, really remarkable. Um, but, but yeah, where are we now? Yep. Let me start off, uh, Clay, and we'll kick it off. So uh, at this point in time, we've treated a little over uh, 2,000 patients and uh, have seen uh, the whole gamut of therapy, starting with uh, plasma, as well as remdesivir. We've had patients on ECMO, about nine of them, of which five of them walked out of the hospital alive. So we've had a remarkable, uh, what do you call, uh, trajectory with this illness. And just as all of you mentioned, as we began the process, we were not very clear how it would go, looking at the mortality numbers, et cetera. But as we have done better and better, we found that we've done a, a lot better in the past few months than we did originally. And we were able to take patients on, take care of them, do that very well. In addition, we also found that uh, as where we are today is we've managed to keep our associates safe. We've managed to get enough PPE, enough testing, so we have no issue with testing because we do have adequate testing facilities, both for the immediate turnaround test with about 15 minutes. We have about 250 to 300 of those tests a day. And within 15 hours, we have about 1,500 tests a day in addition. So we've been able to do that. We've also been able to manage to bring patients in and be able to screen all those patients. We started very tentatively because we did not have adequate testing capacity to be able to test only patients with symptoms, which subsequently expanded to everyone coming in. And then we also made sure that we were able to kind of put in place the things that people need to be able to feel safe. That, that was common to all of us in terms of the hospital systems. We made sure that we are able to screen people, be able to restrict visitation, and bring the folks in and be able to have them come in a, at the right time, as well as provide adequate uh, precautions, both sanit sanitizing hands, et cetera, checking temperatures, be able to do that, not just for them, but also for our staff. In addition, we also made sure that as we reopen, we were able to start our work, especially surgical cases. I'd like to sp spend a couple of minutes on this, mainly because of the fact what we're talking about is essential surgeries. People who needed to have surgeries which were being postponed because they were afraid to come out or the schedules were off or things like that. And so we were able to restart those surgeries, making sure that we had adequate PPE, adequate supplies, adequate uh, beds, adequate capacity in order to ensure that we're in compliance with everything that came down from the governor, but also to ensure that our patients have the ability to get tested. And just like what Jay mentioned, we also have a large outpatient practice so a lot of the things that we ne needed to do was to be able to ensure that we're able to carry on and manage that. And so where we are today is we are in a, in a position where we have adequate beds, adequate supplies, adequate facilities to take care of patients and be able to do that in a safe and effective manner, as well as for the outpatient parts of our, uh, of our system, we're able to switch very quickly from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual and a combination of all of those. But at the end of the day, as a system, and as, as partners in Austin with all the three systems together, we, we can confidently state that we as a community have done this a whole lot better than many other communities by virtue of us sharing this information, by being together in what we do, by addressing the public, by addressing the press, by doing things together so that there was no element of trying to one-up somebody or do anything that way and keep the public interest as well as the health of our patients and our staff first. And I'm very proud to be part of this group. Yeah, yeah me too. So I, I, I suspect that's pretty universal. Everybody's ready to go, ready for business, still doing some things, telemedicine, but 
operating, ready to go. Anything to add, Ken? Looks like you might have some. Yeah, I would add that if you go to one of our hospitals today, uh, first of all, they're very safe places and they're probably as safe or safer now than ever. But the, it doesn't look exactly the same as it did pre-COVID. So most of us have our, our entrances are restricted. So there's only one or two entrances to the hospital. And when you go there, you're going to have a temperature screening. You'll have some questions asked of you about your, your risk for COVID. Um, all visitors and all employees are wearing masks. So there are a number of um, uh, precautions that are in place for you know, what we call universal protection that are new that you would not have seen pre-COVID. Um, in terms of our hospital operations, I think they've essentially normalized. So we've been able to resume elective surgery um, and, uh, and pretty much all of the non-COVID care uh, uh, as the surge has abated. So in July, a lot of that had to be suspended in order to have an adequate number of beds for the COVID patients. But at this point, I believe we've all been able to resume our normal elective surgery schedule. We also have visitor restrictions still in place. And so, you know, most patients can have one visitor, uh, but there, you know, definitely are still um, either level two or three visitation restrictions in place. So those are some of the differences that you might see today that it's not just business as usual. Not just business as usual, but it's good business. It's a, it's good care for patients, acknowledging that it's another, you know, the, the setting just like the HEB in, in which uh, uh, people congregate. Um, good. Um, so I, I, wanna, I wanna pivot a little um, to to the issue that, that Rob first introduced. So, um, and there's a there's a question too that's come in on the Q and A, and that just reminds me I should have set it up front. Please, if you've got questions, we will take some, probably not all of them, because they'll I suspect there'll be many, if from the Q and A, not from the chat. So that's that button on the bottom that says Q and A. Just go there, and you can uh, type in your questions, and then I I see those and and can ask them. So. Um, you know, Rob, you raised the issue of, of delayed care. So, so I have some stats on that that, that, are, that are interesting. They're, they're from early on, but that's, you know, now we're dealing with some of the consequences from what happened early on. And this, a lot of this continued in the second wave. So um, emergency department utilization, this is national data, down 42%. Um, the number of patients seeking care for MI, for heart attack, down 23%. And you know, I'm, I'm a stroke neurologist. The number of patients seeking care for stroke down 20%. Um, they, those weren't reductions in numbers of strokes and heart attacks or numbers of emergencies, although trauma did go down in a real way, right? People weren't driving as much. And so that was, that was associated with a, a decrease um, of visits for those reasons. That was not the case for stroke or MI. And then for the prevention services, and this is worse than I thought it was, there was an, um, about a 90% decline in screening for cervical, colon, and breast cancer. So, yeah, you know, the procedures associated with those things, and they just, uh, people weren't coming in for those uh, visits. And, and that has, in some, uh, that has continued and also impacted vaccination, um, including childhood vaccinations, normal vaccinations. So, so I, I just want to, um, how, how has this impacted um, the work that you all have done? Are we starting to see that turn around? Uh, have you seen the consequences of this um, you know, in, inappropriately avoiding um, good medical care? So Clay, if I could, I could yeah, Jay, address that. Um, we have a very large Medicare population and as you're well aware, one of the things that Medicare requires is an annual wellness visit. And um, we have seen a decrease in our annual wellness visits by about 60% compared to last year. At this time last year, we were probably very close to having 80% of our annual wellness visits um, performed. Uh, this year, we're about 43% right now uh, overall. Um, and the importance of that one visit alone 
is that that is really where most of the time you're discussing the preventative maintenance uh, services for your patient population. That's where you're talking to them about getting their, their, their cervical screening done, getting their mammogram done, getting their colonoscopy done, getting their, their routine blood work done for their chronic medical problems. And so that has, has, subsa- uh, has been a substantial hit to uh, our ability to be able to deliver that care. I think our pediatric population has seen even a more significant decrease in the annual wellness visits for for the pediatric population um, because parents have been somewhat um, skeptical about bringing their children in. I want to assure uh, the the people on this this broadcast today, uh, as well as I'm sure the rest of our panel does, that we are taking every step that we possibly can to ensure the safety of your family and your family members uh, for preventative care because we recognize that if we fail to do that right now, that we're going to pay a price, not necessarily simply in, in, in monetary price, but a price in the health of those people that we, we love and care for on a daily basis in the future if we don't do the preventive services. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, build on what you said. I mean, some of the you know, I think it's important for the, the audience to understand just the early magnitude of what we're seeing. And you quoted some of the statistics, but um, you know, at the time we've seen ED visits go up, there, there have been a couple of uh, studies that have shown in big metropolitan areas, uh, you know, Chicago, New York, the number of EMS calls have gone down, but the number of cardiac arrest calls have actually gone way up. So about three times what they saw over the same time period last year but the most disturbing thing about that is those cardiac arrest calls, just over a third of those patients died. If you look at the data set from last year, two thirds of the patients died from the data set from this year. So we're seeing people delaying care in a way that is driving not just greater morbidity or illness, but it's actually affecting people's mortality. And the, and the, the numbers from the CDC, at least again, as you said, these are kind of early from I think early February to around mid-June are estimating somewhere between 100 to 150,000 excess deaths as a result of delaying care. These are non-COVID deaths. So these are other, you know, chronic conditions that people are just putting off and they're afraid to come to the hospital. So I I hope one of the takeaway messages is Jay saying is we are going above and beyond to ensure that our facilities are safe. As, As you said earlier, thankfully, the precautions we've take, taken, and I think Samson said this, we've seen a very low rate of sort of spread within the hospital between patients and our healthcare workers and certainly from patients to patients. So by far the, the, the place that we were seeing, and thankfully that's calmed down, but the place that we were seeing, you know, as recently as a few weeks ago, uh, where the spread was the most was in the community. And, and at least within our system at one time, you know, we, we went from a period where about 8% of the people we were testing were positive all the way up to one in four patients that we tested for COVID were coming back positive. And so uh, that's come back down now to, to just now getting down below 10% again. But, um, but our hospitals and our clinics are safe and, and the, the impact of not following up on those things that we consider routine care, thankfully, in the U.S., their routine care for chronic conditions, and we've got to be able to do that because it's going to—it's having a huge impact. Yeah. Anything, hey, to add? Rob? Rob, this is Ken. If I could just comment or, or get you to expound a little bit. Really, during the lockdown, um, almost every general surgeon that I talked to, including John Abbey Collard, who's the uh, president of Travis County Medical Society, told me that. Almost every case of appendicitis they were seeing or gallbladder or acute cholecystitis, the the patients were delaying sometimes several days and coming in with much more substantial disease than they otherwise normally would have seen and then requiring longer hospitalization. So was that your experience? And do you have anything you would like to add on that particular aspect of delayed care? No, it, it absolutely has been our experience. And, and I think the you know, so the first piece of that is, it, it, as we all know, as physicians, you know, getting to most disease processes earlier makes our job much easier and it makes the outcomes better. Getting to things late in the disease process makes it more difficult. So we saw that with appendicitis, diverticulitis, you know, the, these things where if people seek care earlier, a lot of times the management, frankly, can be non-operatively or the operative management's much easier. 
but late in the course, it's harder. The, the other thing is that I think we're all sensitive to when, when we saw the increase in hospitalizations, we were also strained within our hospital at times with patients, again, who were presenting with more, you know, a, a higher severity of illness. So that puts stress again on the system. And so, you know, we, we argued that stopping elective cases early on allowed us to have capacity within our hospitals. I think it did. But at the same time, you know, most of those things that we do that we call elective that people think, well, that means you don't have to have it. That's really, as Samson said, not what it means. It means you have to have it at some point. You know, if we can get those people into the system, take care of them in a, in a lower acuity setting, i.e. an outpatient surgery or something that's easier, then it, it prevents them putting stress on the system later should we see, you know, again, this sort of seesaw pattern of surges within within COVID or flu or whatever else may be coming at us over the winter months. Maybe other aspect is uh, specifically with regards to cancer and cancer diagnoses. Uh, in addition to what Ken and Rob mentioned, uh, surgeons have also been telling us that a lot of folks have uh, uh, not done their regular checkups as a result of which either the, the cancer when they present them are in a, in a later stage than where they are. And this is a trend which is seen nationally. The other aspect of postponing care, as Jay mentioned, with uh, regard to Medicare patients is one aspect, but we also need to consider the a segment of the population which does not take precautions for care. And now with this added threat of the pandemic, they're postponing care even worse. And we are yet to see the, uh, what, what, is, what is up in the air with that aspect. And just to, just, to, just to pull you guys, and you can do the thumbs up or thumbs down on, on these quick ones. Um, somebody needs a mammogram, should they delay it or get it, it, should they get it now? Get it now. Okay. Colonoscopy. They need it. You'd say, Rob, or can you say screen most, you guys said, okay. Um, and, um, and Ken, you're, you're saying that because it's an every 10 year thing and so maybe you could delay it. Yeah, Once it's every 10 years. So if you're asymptomatic, that might be one you could delay a few months. Uh, and there are some alternative screening tests available, um, you know, with, with, for colon cancer in particular. So that might be one that, that you could delay if you didn't have major risk and your doctor was comfortable with that. Okay. I did. How about that vac uh, uh, um, checkup for your kids, including their vaccinations? Do it now? Always, always. So everybody, everybody's thumbs up high up on that one. Um, in, um, how about, this is, I mean, obviously we're doctors, but there's a question about dental care. Uh, dental care, do it now. There's one uh, thumbs up. You guys are going to play thumbs up. Rob, you're in a... No, I, I, I am. I, I think you need to check with those offices to ensure they're taking the same precautions, Clay. But if they are, I, I can tell you, I, I checked out my daughter's orthodontist uh, clinic pretty thoroughly, but she had her braces adjusted last week. So. Okay. And then I'm not going to ask you, there's a question about, well, you know, if you have chest pain, well, what should you do? You, you have, everybody's made that crystal clear, if, unless you really weren't listening, <laughs> you, you understand that for chest pain or any kind of neurological symptoms or anything that would normally be an emergency, and you, you know, even if you're uncertain and you think it's an emergency, if you're fortunate to be an ARC and you can call somebody and say, is this an emergency or not, maybe you'd do that. Otherwise, call 911 and come to the emergency room. Those are safe places and all these guys have, already made that point and, and uh, we don't, we don't want to deal with your stroke five days later when we can give you, uh, you know, take that clot out in within the first few hours and, and, and make you better at very, very low risk for anything else bad happening to you. Um, okay, let's talk about telemedicine a little bit. So, um, some of your systems have outpatient care and some don't. Um, can you, you know, telemedicine, we had a huge uptick. So for, for our clinics, we were doing, it was like 80% of our visits were telemedicine visits, you know, boom, like that, it just all of a sudden happened. And um, we're still now at, we're getting closer to 50-50, but we still haven't gone back to anything like where we were before. So is, is telemedicine here to stay? What, what can and what can't we do uh, with telemedicine? 
I, I believe this toothpaste is out of the tube already and it's never going to get put back in. Um, patients have found that it's beneficial. We were talking before we came online here that one of the people um, on the panel, not on this panel, but a, a more extended panel, just had a televisit for the first time the other day and they found it to be an extremely enjoyable and, and, and time efficient uh, use uh, of their time. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a, there's a need for it. I don't think that there's a, 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 an, an absolute necessity to be in the physician office every single time for every single chronic illness. There's a lot that we can do um, very much either through a video visit or even through just a phone conversation. I do think that there is an absolute necessity though for physicians to be able to examine patients. And I don't think that we'll ever be able to replace that because there is an awful lot of information that comes from the, the, the thorough examination of a patient, especially those who have chronic disease where, as you're looking for complications to that chronic disease. Any other thoughts on that, Samson? Yes. Uh specifically in terms of uh, meeting people at their uh, place of need. And at the time of need, telemedicine actually takes care of that spot very well. We've had a tremendous increase, as all of you, in, in the telemedicine visits. It's actually made it a whole lot easier to take the sort of care that could be provided through a portal like telemedicine, which Jay mentioned, absolutely, to, to take that aspect. It has also created efficiencies for our physicians because what has happened is, just as, as you can kind of take those patients who can do a telemedicine visit, so that time has actually been reserved for people who need to come in, and the only option for them is to be seen, so we're able to do that. Most importantly, I hope something good comes out of it for the U.S. healthcare system, because at the end of the day, we do not have adequate facilities and physicians to take care of the need of the community, especially with the aging population. So this, I hope, is a trend that is there to stay. The fact that uh, reimbursement has actually caught up with where we should have been all along is a positive factor, and I hope that never gets rolled back. Great. Anything else? Yeah, I would, I would add to that, Clay, that um, telemedicine has been on the back burner for 20 years, and it's really been waiting on some kind of mandate to allow reimbursement for telemedicine. And so I think the pandemic has really helped leapfrog telemedicine into, um, you know, into the future so that the physicians can actually be paid for providing telemedicine services. And like Jay said, the toothpaste is out of the tube. Uh, I think patients have experienced the ease of a telemedicine visit. I had my first one with uh, one of my physicians recently and it was great. We could still chat. He didn't really need to examine me. Uh, I was able to do it from my office. I didn't have to fight my way up Mopac, even though it doesn't take as long right now as it normally does. But uh, I loved it. It was great. So um, I think it's here to stay. Yeah, it's it's remarkable too. Like the the biggest uptick for us has been in uh, in psychiatry. Um, the the um, uptake has been just tremendous there, and and continues those folks are not converting back to face-to-face to -face visits. In some ways, you might think that would be a particularly difficult one to convert to telemedicine, but uh, um, that is clearly not the case. And uh, so, yeah, interesting. Clay, if, if I could just make one further comment, since this is the chamber that we're speaking to today, I would advocate for all of the, the business owners uh, on this, this conference call today to work with their local associations and national associations to, to lobby um, uh, Congress to uh, make telemedicine a permanent part of our healthcare program. As businesses that have employees that have chronic illnesses, oftentimes your business, your business suffers because your employee has to take time off to go for an in-person visit or things that could be done over the phone, which would, would um, significantly decrease the amount of time off and the loss of productivity for, for, the, for the businesses. And I think uh, this is a great opportunity as a, as a coalition to advocate for some changes within the healthcare system that, that do need to be made more permanent and that will benefit everybody across the board. Agreed. Yeah, I agree. I think it's gonna, it's gonna benefit the, you know, the whole population to have telemedicine is another option and for rural health too. It's gonna, it could 
dramatically improve our ability to care for folks that are outside our cities. Um, here's a, here's a, it's an interesting question and we've had some conversations about this and that's maternity care. So yeah, you can do some things in, in, um, in OB care before that you can convert that to telemedicine, but how, what does that look like now? And that's not something you can delay generally. Um, so uh, yeah, how, how is that working in, in the hospitals? Start off with uh, it's, it's specifically with OB care. Given the fact that somebody has to come in and they have to have a baby, one of the things we uh, took right at the beginning of the pandemic was testing to that population. We were able to test them prior to their coming in for elective procedures, and as well as be able to test them when they came in. Now we're able to extend that testing to the folks that come in with them, so that we're able to keep them all safe. The idea behind all of this. Uh, uh, is the world has changed significantly. And this is something that we're going to be having with us for quite some time. So we found a way to manage that. And at this point in time, just us, I let Ken speak for his system and Rob, but we've all found that we have to adapt and change that. Matern maternity care has changed, but the more it's changed, the more it has remained the same, except for the fact that we test them, have the precautions, do all of that. And also the fact is, uh, the PPE and usage of PPE and all of those have been uh, are quite prevalent in, in that area, mainly because of the risk of blood and pathogen infections. So that has actually gotten much more. And it's all, it's, it's all good in that way because you keep the healthcare worker safe, you keep the patient safe, you keep the baby safe. It's all good in that, in that manner. Great. Anything to add, Ken? You want to add something? I think that um, other than the testing, uh, mask and limitation of visitors to just one birth partner. OB care is really about the same as it was pre-COVID. Some of the changes more likely are in the outpatient setting. So I'm not really necessarily the one to speak to that. Jay may have some insight into changes in OB care in the outpatient setting. Yeah, I think that uh, from the standpoint of the outpatient setting, what has changed is that some of the early visits where there's not necessarily the requirement to um, do fetal heart tones, et cetera, um, may have been able to be uh, uh, taken care of with televisits. But obviously, um, as the pregnancy has progresses along and, and there's a need for uh, monitoring uh, the fetal health, it, it does become important to get in. But again, we've recognized that from the very beginning and we've taken significant steps at, at ensuring that we have very clean, very um, uh, safe environments for our, for our patient population to be able to do that. I don't think there's anybody on this panel, anybody within any of these organizations who would ever want to go to bed at night thinking to themselves that they didn't do everything that they possibly could do to prevent one person from getting COVID infection. And I think that's something that the, the general public really needs to understand is every day we get up with, with one goal in mind, and that's to protect the patient population that we serve. And to, and to think that we didn't do everything we could to, to, to help protect them in, in, in the long term uh, while meeting their short term needs, I don't think any of us would sleep well at night. Yeah. I'll overlay one uh, story. I, I had my uh, my wife and I had our first grandchild in June, uh, so we experienced COVID, a COVID delivery on the other side. And after, after my wife expressed her deep disappointment in me for not breaking the rules and sneaking her into the delivery room, uh, I, at which time I thought she might climb through the air conditioning ducts to get there, mm -hmm. um, it, it went fine. I mean, the the things that people did, uh, as they mentioned, it's it's sort of a muted experience compared to a normal birth, but uh, it went well. Uh, my son actually did the delivery on Zoom, not with the video, but uh, so all these things have changed and we figured out ways to adapt. And, and, I, and I think it's, as Ken said, both on the outpatient side and the inpatient side, that, that piece is going very well. So, Wow, the delivery on Zoom, but without the video, that's probably the right way to go. Or you could turn the camera. You had to turn the camera towards the little, to the bassinet where the baby gets put. It, it was there you a go. strange yeah. experience and I felt bad for my daughter-in-law, but that's the way they wanted to do it. So I, I said, okay. Uh, yeah, that's great. Um, good. Hey, lots of discussion about flu uh, and uh, just to, uh, and for good reason, right? I mean, uh, 
flu's gonna gonna gum things up. Um, it, it typically fills our hospitals um, uh, in the in the winter time in a in a in a moderate to severe flu season. Um, and obviously we're nervous about that. Um, and also people with flu symptoms coming to get testing is going to also gum things up. Um, and we don't know how flu and COVID will work together, right? So what, it, what's, what's, what are you all thinking about flu and in particular about vaccination? Um, are we ready yet? Do your systems have the vaccine yet? Um, uh, when should people get that? We received our first uh, shipment of vaccine this week. Um, we plan on rolling it out uh, the 1st of September. Um, and we anticipated an increased demand for it. So we, we actually ordered an additional 20% to what our normal order is. Um, and, and we'll see. I think that there's some evidence coming out of the uh, Southern Hemisphere right now that the flu season has been less than um, what was predicted because of the, the uh, gowning, masking, and self-isolation. Uh, so it has decreased the rate of the flu, um, at least in the Southern Hemisphere. Fingers crossed, we'll see the same. Yeah, Samson? Absolutely. Similar to that, uh, again, similar experience from that aspect. Uh, I hope that uh, hand precautions and sanitizing hands, wearing a mask will keep our population safer. And again, uh, we're hoping that uh, we will definitely have uh, more people raising their hands and getting the flu vaccine. And then when the right vaccine appears for COVID, probably doing that. In terms of testing, we're working together in terms of trying to get uh, testing for the flu and the COVID at the same time. And we'll be ready for it, uh, Clay, when, 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 when it appears. Good. Yeah, we have it too. So we got it. And in, in we just went ahead and started. You know, the CDC's recommendation is to, to do it uh, um, sep September, October for maximum efficacy through the flu season. Um, but uh, I, we don't want to, you know, reduce the chance that somebody will ultimately get it. So that, you know, then we're really focused on as a community, how do we get it out to people who haven't gotten it before? You know, our vaccination rates for, for flu vaccine, they're not that good. Um, you know, it's not even 60% of the population in, in a typical year will get the vaccine. So we have, we have work to do if we're, uh, if we're going to roll it out. Um, good. Um, so some interesting questions and, in, and in you all aren't, we're not, the four of us are not the, the, the five of us that are not the perfect, uh, group to answer these questions, but some questions about the the kind of epidemiology and background risks. So I'm gonna throw them out there. Um, one is, is about numbers. So what the heck's going on in Texas is the question. Um, if you look at New York, um, they have many fewer cases than we do. Um, you know, the daily numbers of, of 800 versus 5,000. And even if you, you know, adjust for population, that's still a huge, you know, almost five-fold difference, at least a four-fold difference in cases. So um, what explains the difference? Um, and what can we do to get it down? This is my addition to the question. Um, so it looks, we look more like New York. We may not want to look like New York in any other way, but in, in this, in this uh, COVID incidence. Anybody want to try that one? You guys, you guys are internists, so mostly. Clay, you know, I think they peaked at a different time than we did, obviously, and everybody will remember the horrific pictures of what was going on in New York in, uh, in April, I believe. And so, you know, it's just kind of gone in waves across the country. And if you go back and you look at how we reopen in the state, uh, we we re re reopened pretty quickly, um, you know, reopened bars a little quickly. You know, I've heard Governor Abbott say if he could go back and do it all over again, uh, he would not have opened bars so soon. Uh, we weren't, in my opinion, uh, quite as forceful on wearing masks uh, as we reopened. Uh, and so what can we do to... Uh, to get our numbers down are the things that we've been doing. Social distancing, hand washing, everyone wearing masks, 
uh, maintaining some of the restrictions on mobility, uh, you know, a large congregations of people in places like bars. And so, you know, there's probably some bar owners that are on this call today. I don't mean to pick on you. I'm very empathetic to other business owners that have been severely impacted uh, by the pandemic uh, economically. We're all there. We're all in the same boat. And that's one of the messages that uh, I think we, we leave this conference today with is that, um, you know, the better job we do of keeping our community safe and, and, and following these guidelines, uh, the more quickly we can get back to normal. So what do you think, Claire, I would like to add is to make sure that people, if they have symptoms or they think they have it, is to stay uh, isolated and get tested. Because I don't think we're past the danger yet with colleges reopening, schools reopening, got to be still stay vigilant. So that would be my only appeal to, the, to this group. Great, good. All right, those are those are great answers, and I, you know, we, um, we we believe in freedom here in in, in Texas, and um, personal liberties are really really important to us. And and uh, public health crises sometimes force a, a trade off between personal liberties and and, uh, and, and, and behaviors that are positive for and, uh, for public health and. Um, different states, different populations are going to make different decisions about how to create that balance. And I know it will, will respond. Um, so um, some, some interesting questions about, um, uh, about the, um, the, neuro, the psychiatric implications of, 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 the, of the outbreak. So, the question relates to unemployment and unemployment's impact on, on mental health. Um, but obviously there, there are other, um, beyond unemployment, there are other impacts that uh, COVID has had on mental health. So um, uh, do you wanna, you wanna talk a little, a little about that? I mean, uh, have you seen that or what's your, what's your take on that in terms of, of, of how it's impacted uh, your your enterprises. Well, you, uh, we probably share faculty in terms of uh, what do you call the Department of uh, Psychiatry, and what we have seen is uh, uh, specifically with regards to the communities, a lot lot more people coming in uh, seeking uh, seeking help, but most of that have been met with telemedicine. On the flip side, we've also seen that folks have had much less stress because of working differently so that's that's the other side of it so we still have have to see what studies come out later but at the end of the day uh, specifically as we see recently there are still a lot of emergency department visits for people with acute uh, uh, psych symptoms because most of them have not been able to keep up with their regularly scheduled care that is one of the gaps and this is not an area which i think we've done really well as a country mainly because of the fact that we've we've kind of put less input into psychiatric care, less money into psychiatric care as a country. So we are seeing some of the effects of that. The only place I would probably say is uh, specifically one of the, th the good things that have come out of this pandemic is it's actually strengthened the bonds between people because finally you realize once taken out of, uh, take, once you take all these out, finally relationships are all that keep it going. So people have actually had more time to connect with their families, be able to do all of that, and 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 get back to the original sense in of the word, what what exactly makes you go, in terms of relationships and family and fellowships and friends and things like that. So that has actually strengthened. the The flip side of this is we still ought to be very vigilant because the the feelings of inadequacy among healthcare workers, specifically with the intensive care physicians and nurses and staff as they lose patients is very real. So we are watching that very carefully and keeping up with making sure people have resources and things. The second aspect of that is we've had a very unusual thing in which people are sometimes dying without their family members being there, specifically with COVID. And that has affected uh, both the families because uh, just like uh, Rob mentioned with Zoom, there are instances where we've had to have, have different kinds of technology to be able to bring the family in. And a lot of times our staff, our nurses, and our physicians are the only family at that time. 
So they actually agree with the patient and that has a lot of effects on our caregivers. And most importantly, for the few who actually got COVID either uh, one way or the other, it has actually profoundly changed their lives. And as they look at life and getting a second lease on life, I do hope that they lead more fulfilling lives. And those of us in society who've not had that opportunity or who are lucky enough not to get that should, rec should realize the lessons out of that and make sure that we can do all we can and fulfill the purpose that God has put us on this earth for. Thank you. Great. Great. Well, I hate to end on a somber note, but it's an important one. And we are just a little over time. So I want to thank you all, you, the uh, CMOs, uh, uh, for the great, uh, for great panel today, but also even more importantly for the wonderful work you're doing um, collectively uh, to, to help us as a community get through this terrible outbreak. And I want to hand it over to, uh, to Laura. Great. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And thank all of you. Uh, I learned a bunch during this panel. Uh, I think I was most surprised by the Zoom delivery. Uh, but other than that, my takeaway is there's lots that we can be doing to take care of our healthcare issues even during this time. So thanks for the insight. And, and maybe even most importantly, thank you for working together during this time. Thank you for not competing and worrying about market share and instead of worry, worrying about community care. I think that is uh, just a wonderful indication of how our health ecosystem is in fact working in Austin. Um, I want to quickly show you guys some upcoming events. We've got the Comptroller Glenn Hager is going to talk about the Texas economy on September 1st. Uh, Google career certificates, which is an important thing we've identified during this time, the need for certificates, and the IT talent show of tomorrow, that's September 17th. Um, and if you have not yet had a chance to fill out your census form, please take a few minutes and do that. There's a whole lot of important things that flow from the information that uh, is gathered in the census. So uh, with that, I want to thank again, Samson, Jay, Rob, Kenneth, and Clay. This has been wonderful and informative and thank you to our sponsors and supporters. You all have a great afternoon. Thank you for having